When I uh, heard about this project, I read the so-called feasibility study. Um, I'm a hydrogeologist, and I'm also a glacial geologist, and I deal with groundwater. And I know a few things about central Indiana, and I also know a few things about dams. Unless you're building in an earthquake-prone area, the biggest issue with any dam, geologically speaking, is groundwater. Yet, the DLZ feasibility study says, quote, groundwater does not appear to be an issue with this project. In a few short minutes, I'm going to show you why that is absolute absurdity. Um, my first slide, it just simply a quick summation of some off-the-cuff things I found just doing a cursory review of public data. First of all, there is significant potential for this reservoir to function like a leaky bathtub. Because unlike the other central Indiana reservoirs, this reservoir site is not all in tight glacial till. Most of the walls are sand and gravel. And if how many people here get their water from a well? A lot of you. What do you think that well's made in? It's made in sand and gravel, very permeable stuff. When you raise the water level via a reservoir, you're going to change the groundwater levels in the area around it. There's a possibility for a, pro a phenomenon called piping, which is at a dam site, very permeable materials at the abutment, water seeps through them, you actually get groundwater erosion. If you heard of the Grand Teton Dam failure out in Idaho a couple decades ago, that was called, caused by piping through sand and gravel around the dam abutment. Catastrophic dam failure. There are hundreds and probably thousands of existing and abandoned water wells within the footprint of this reservoir. What are you going to do about that? We all rely on groundwater for drinking water because it's naturally filtered. There are known abandoned dumps and landfills in the footprint of the site. And there's also been a contention that, well, this reservoir is going to alleviate a regional water shortage. I'm here to tell you there is no regional water shortage. There's plenty of water. What there is is a regional capacity shortage. Big difference. Next slide, please. Um, anyway, here is the, the quote. Groundwater does not appear to be an issue with this project. Um, that borders on irresponsibility if you're dealing with dams, because groundwater is always the major issue with any dam. Next slide. Um, this is a hill-shaded LIDAR image of the area. Here's Anderson Mounds. Here's Delaware County up here. I believe the proposed reservoir would extend somewhere up here upstream of 69. Um, all I'm putting this on to show you is you'll notice that there are lots of strange linear to anastomosing features on our landscape here. This was produced during the last episode of glaciation. The White River Channel migrated numerous times while the ice sheet was here. And as it did, it would deposit these sinuous bodies of sand and gravel. And then it would, the river would move over in response to a movement of the ice margin, do it all over. And pretty soon, you've got this stack of crisscrossing sand and gravel bodies with fine-grained glacial till in between. Next slide. So this is a cross-section at about the latitude of Mound State Park from east to west. Here's the river in the middle. Anything that's colored in red, orange, or yellow is a sand and gravel body. And as I alluded to, there are multiple generations of them. Anything in gray is fine-grained glacial till and then the limestone bedrock way down at the bottom. The scale vertically, this bluff here would be about 80 to 100 feet high. So it gives you some idea. This is a schematic diagram 
What it's showing you schematically is the sand and gravel complex that underlies this area that's referred to in several DNR Division of Water reports. They call it a complex of sand and gravel bodies. And that's a good description. Next slide. Why is this important? OK, this slide shows these contrasting materials on the top. The gray material is glacial till. It's an unsorted mixture of sand, silt, clay, and boulders, slowly permeable, if at all. On the bottom, the orange material is gravel, very permeable. If you imagine having half of this room filled with bowling balls and the other half filled with stacks of newspaper, and you released a million gallons of water at the ceiling, well, which side of the room is it going to flow through? The bowling balls. That's the analogy. So these sand and gravel bodies, they're very permeable. They're very extensive. They extend back under the uplands. All of you with wells get your water either from sand and gravel bodies or from the limestone bedrock to which these sand and gravel bodies are hydraulically connected. Next slide. So again, now we're going to put the water table as it currently exists on this cartoon, and that's shown in blue. The key point to note here, the arrows show the direction of groundwater flow. Groundwater flow right now is inwards towards the White River. The White River is sustained by discharge of groundwater. And the spectacular fens at Mound State Park, that's groundwater, comes out of this upper sand and gravel body 24-7, 365. A lot of groundwater. If you've been to mounds, looked at those areas, there are thousands of gallons a minute of groundwater coming out just along the length of the river encompassed by mounds. And it's like that all along the river. Next slide. Now let's suppose we put a reservoir here and you raise the water level some 40 to 70 feet above what the current river level is, you're going to create a mound, a groundwater mound, where that reservoir is. And that's going to cause water to flow back into the sand and gravel bodies. They're going to act like a drain. Moreover, in low parts of the landscape, upland landscape, away from the river, you're going to probably raise the water table. What about the people who live here and have basements here or septic systems? There's going to be a problem. It's going to get wet in some of these low areas because that water has to go somewhere. If you're talking about a pool level of 870 to 875, go look at a topographic map. There are lots of areas away from the river near that elevation that are they're going to become wetlands. Next slide. This is a map I took directly off Division of Water's well database. Every dot on here, every circle is a known water well location. Every triangle is one or more unlocated water wells. As you can see, there are hundreds of wells close to this project. And it's generally acknowledged you know, these are based on water well records or construction reports the well drillers submit. It is generally acknowledged that this database in any given area represents perhaps 10% of the wells that are out there. So multiply that by 10. And, you know, every house outside of the public water suppliers, it's got a well. So what's going to happen if you flood all these wells? If you do, surface water, and we know the White River, according to IDEM, is what they call impaired. It's full of nutrients, pesticides, and other problematic constituents that aren't present in naturally filtered groundwater. Now you've got hundreds of potential conduits down to every aquifer in this area. I'd say that's a grave threat to groundwater quality. Because you can hunt for all of these old wells and plug some of them, which in and of itself is a time-consuming and expensive proposition. So they have to be filled with cement or swelling clay. You're not going to find all of them. You just aren't. 
lot of them are buried, and you're going to end up with a problem in the groundwater. Next slide. Finally, to address this groundwater shortage, these are maps again from the Division of Water. This map is the statewide groundwater availability map. In general, the cooler colors, the blues, the greens, and the yellows, those are areas of large groundwater availability. And then the hot colors are areas of lesser groundwater availability. I've blown up the section of the map with Marion, Hamilton, and Madison counties. There are a lot of areas with, we're talking where you can typically put a well down and get 500 to several thousand gallons a minute out of a, pro a properly constructed large diameter well. Next slide. This is Marion County specifically, and again, it just shows the whites and the blues and the stippled areas are areas of high groundwater availability. I constructed the geologic atlas of Marion County. There are wells in this area that yield 5,000 gallons a minute. They have barely begun to tap their groundwater resource. It is always infinitesimally less expensive to supply water from a well field than it is through a reservoir. Moreover, the groundwater quality is much better, your treatment costs are much less, and you're right there where the water distribution infrastructure is. I think, I think this notion of a groundwater or a water shortage is silly. There's no water shortage, there just is a shortage of actual wells or intake points or treatment facilities. There's no shortage of water in central Indiana. Disabuse yourself of that notion. You can pump millions, tens of millions of gallons of groundwater a day anywhere along the White River, supply all the water you could ever need for 50 to 100 years of growth without making a dent in the water table here. So I'm done. Thank you.